is a pretty impressive study. I'm going to call to order the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Sea Power and Projection Forces. I want to welcome everyone here today, thank our witnesses for being here. We do have votes that will be called at some point, so what we're going to try to do is to get through uh, our opening statements and the witnesses' opening statements and then take a short recess to go vote and then we will be back. Well, again, I want to thank our witnesses for joining us today and our members. And as the Sea Power and Projection Forces Subcommittee Chairman, I lead a group of my colleagues with broad jurisdiction over naval and Air Force programs. And I must admit that I have a particular affinity for the United States Marine Corps and its amphibious warfare role because I represent Marine Corps Base Quantico in Virginia's 1st Congressional District. Because of my district and because of this subcommittee's jurisdiction, I'm particularly interested in our subject today of assessing our Marine Corps' ability to project forces in a contested environment. Late last year, I was particularly intrigued to read a report authored by one of our witnesses today entitled Advancing Beyond the Beach, Amphibious Operations in an Era of Precision Weapons. In this report, the authors propose that the current approach to amphibious operations needed, and I quote, new operating concepts and capabilities that circumvent or defeat increasingly effective coastal defenses. Their report proposes a new strategic approach that emphasizes lighter vehicles, a rebalancing of the surface and aviation assault capabilities, an emphasis on surface connectors that optimize ocean travel and improved armament on amphibious ships. I believe that the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessment has accurately assessed the problems associated with amphibious assault in a contested environment. Projecting power in close proximity to shore and in a contested environment is fraught with challenges which may require a shift in our approach. Fundamental changes to the Na Department of Navy's strategic amphibious warfare investments may be necessary to move more effectively above or to move Marines ashore. I believe that it is incumbent upon the Marine Corps to rapidly change their legacy force structure toward a capability that is more expeditionary, capable of fighting in the littorals, and when called upon, able to project power ashore in even the most challenging of environments. To better assess this issue, I'm pleased to have two respected authors on amphibious warfare with us today, Mr. Jesse Sloman, Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessment, and Dr. Brad Martin of the RAND Corporation. Gentlemen, thank you for your willingness to testify before our subcommittee today, and I look forward to your assessment and recommendations to make our Marine Corps forces more lethal and effective than ever. I'd now like to turn to our ranking member, Joe Courtney, for any opening remarks that he may have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on the uh, future of amphibious warfare in a contested environment. And as you noted, this has definitely been a real focus and passion of yours. So uh, again, I, we uh, appreciate your leadership in this issue. As we've uh, heard throughout our hearings this year, the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps team must be prepared to meet new challenges as our potential adversaries rapidly improve their tactics and technologies to counter America's longstanding superiority. This challenge is particularly true in examining the future of amphibious warfare. The United States Navy and Marine Corps team remains the most lethal and advanced amphibious force ever put to sea. As recent events around the world have shown, however, we cannot afford to rest on our laurels. Rather, we must continue to adapt and advance new technologies, tactics, and operational concepts to maintain our capacity to strike from the sea wherever, wherever needed and whenever called. However, we must also recognize the realities and limitations of existing platforms, equipment, and personnel who have not engaged in a contested amphibious assault from the sea in more than six decades. We must explore not only how these platforms can be modernized to maintain relevancy, but also to examine how new technologies and operational concepts can be employed to ensure America's security and to respond to world crises. 
since the cancellation of the expeditionary fighting vehicle in 2011, and I was trying to remember how many hearings we had on that, and that it was at least close to a half dozen uh, before that finally that decision was made. The Navy and Marine Corps have wrestled with the right, what is the right distance for the Marines to disembark the ship and what type of vehicle that should be in. This is not an easy debate and, and is one I'm sure we will talk more about today. However, there is more to this than just what distance an amphibious ship should launch its vehicles or what type of vehicles that should be. Our military is a joint force and will always operate that way in any contingency so that we need to be talking about how to fully integrate our amphibious forces and ensure that they are leveraging the technologies that other forces are, re are relying on. I have no doubt of the value that our amphibious force provides in responding to an array of contingencies from supporting non-combatant evacuation operations to being on the scene responder to the world's next on the scene responder to the world's next humanitarian disaster. However, I also recognize that modeling, simulation, and exercises predicated on uncontested amphibious operations are becoming more outdated by the day. We must be trained, ready, and equipped to operate in a contested environment. Today, we welcome two experts in this field, Dr. Brad Martin and a graduate of Tufts University, uh, Mr. Jesse Sloman. We don't see too many jumbos here, so it's great uh, as a graduate to see you here, Mr. Sloman, to help us better understand the many underlying challenges of operating in a contested littoral environment. I thank them for being here today. I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. We're going to go to our witnesses now. Dr. Martin, we'll begin with your testimony, and then we'll go to Mr. Sloman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Whitman, Ranking Member Courtney, I appreciate the opportunity. Chief. Dr. Martin, just for a second, we'll get you to pull that microphone okay. closer to you. Uh, well, you Chairman thank Whitman, you. thank you. <laughs> Ranking Member Courtney, I appreciate the chance to testify today. Uh, amphibious op operations in the night environments are obviously something that are of, of great importance to the nation. Amphibious forces can be used across the range of military operations. And in fact, they are normally deploying part of our nation's forward presence. They're marked by flexibility, mobility, and scalability, and they can be used in a variety of threat environments. They bring the virtue of capability that's based and sustained at sea with the ability to rapidly project various different types of capabilities ashore, ranging from the provision of humanitarian assistance all the way through significant kinetic strikes. Navy and Marine Corps continue to make investments in force structure and capabilities that will both improve and sustain these capabilities well into the future. However, a variety of actors have acquired ways to contest aspects of amphibious forces and landing force movement, and these range from the types of weapons that non-state actors have used against forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, such as IEDs or uh, explosive boats or things of that nature, through more advanced and sophisticated systems, such as land-based missiles, all the way through sophisticated anti-access and area denial capabilities. In some of these cases, the threats are significant, but manageable. But in the most stressing environments, those in which opponents have significant A2, AD capabilities, anti-access, air denial capabilities, the challenges are significant, and, the, and, and, with some, and there are some shortfalls that we're going to need to address the, in, the, in the near and far term. And much of my testimony deals with this. However, as we discuss this, it's important to remember as context that amphibious forces have always assumed a, a hostile environment requiring that the force overcome opposition. The benign environment was not and is not assumed to be necessary for operations to take place. Moreover, the threats posed in A2AD environments face all conventional forces. So aircraft carrier strike groups, tactical aviation flying from fixed air bases, long, large ground force elements, all of those are things that have to be overcome uh, if they're going to operate in, in a place where the enemy is making a significant a attempt to deny the to deny access. So solving some of those problems for the amphibious force also assist in solving problems for these other forces. Navy and Marine Corps, to their credit, understand the challenges and have acted to meet them. The Navy continues to develop and purchase amphibious ships and surface connectors. The Marine is experiencing significant improvement in, in its aviation capability, which I would describe as being ne nearly revolutionary, with the introduction of the CH-53 Kilo, uh, MV-22, uh, Osprey with its many variants, and in particular, the F-35B. Moreover, the Joint Force continues to seek ways to effectively operate in, in, in an environment in which sophisticated anti-access air denial capabilities exist and need to be neutralized. There are, however, places where shortfalls could impact the ability to conduct future amphibious operations and warrant either additional investment and or changes in operational concepts. The top three of these are, and I hope we can get into more detail on each of them, 
is first, the Navy continues to face difficulty fielding systems that deal with the threat from mines laid at sea and in the surf zone. Mines are relatively easy to acquire and deploy, and in some ways the challenges posed directly in, are more direct against the amphibious force than they are against most others. And while there are promising efforts for unmanned solutions, this remains a challenging area as it has historically. And the second issue is the Marine Corps continues to require the movement of amphibious assault vehicles as the lead element in an assault echelon. The legacy amphib amphibious assault vehicle required that the ships close the beach to one to three miles to allow a launch. And this, this was a movement that both exposed the amphibious shipping to, to threats, but perhaps more importantly, it telegraphed for the force movement in ways that could endanger the landing force. And the program replacements that Marine Corps is looking at are an improvement in terms of range and speed, but the most fundamental issue here may be requiring these to be among the, or may, or may be in requiring this type of force to be among the first elements ashore during ship to shore movement. And this may be more a matter of a change in operational concept and doctrine than investment in new capabilities. And finally, while Navy and Marine Corps will be making near revolutionary, or Navy and Marine Corps in particular, will be making near revolutionary improvement in its aviation capabilities, and, then, and while some of these may in fact be a part, big part of the solution to some of the challenges we've noted, it's not clear that the aviation support platforms that Navy is delivering are optimized to take advantage of this improvement. For example, the Marine Corps insisted that the well deck capability that was absent from the LHA-6 and 7 amphibious assault ships be put back in LHA-8. And while this was understandable, this was done at the expense of the aviation maintenance and ordnance storage capability. And ship options that allow more spots, more ordnance, more aviation fuels and stores probably should be looked at as we move into the next, uh, into further uh, development of the force structure. Now, to conclude, amphibious operations have never been conceived as occurring absent a threat. Combatant, commander value, combatant commanders value these forces, and Navy and Marine Corps have significant and well thought, thought out investment strategies to retain many capabilities. However, there are some significant challenges, some of them of very long standing that require conditional or, or additional emphasis. And so I'll, with that, I will conclude and stand by for questions. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Mr. Sloman. Chairman Whitman, Ranking Member Courtney, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today on the future of amphibious warfare in a contested environment. I wanted to make a few quick points regarding the current challenges the Navy and Marine Corps are facing and how they can overcome those challenges. The margin of superiority that the U.S. military can expect to join the battlefield has eroded over the last several decades as potential adversaries have developed new capabilities specifically intended to counter American strengths. Those capabilities mean that in order to fully contribute to a campaign against a capable adversary, amphibious forces will need to adopt new concepts of operation and field new equipment or use existing equipment in novel ways. We also need to move beyond our bifurcated understanding of conducting amphibious operations, whereby the Navy drives the Marines to the shore, and then the Marines take over and execute a ground fight, to one where we also acknowledge the contributions the Marine Corps can make to the Navy's fight for sea control. One of these new concepts is the use of expeditionary advanced bases. Advanced bases are small, temporary outposts that could constrain the enemy's freedom of action through anti-air or anti-ship attacks. For example, Advanced bases positioned along island chains can employ anti-ship cruise missiles to form, fired from mobile launchers to form a barrier to ships attempting to reach the open water. The Marine Corps should also expand the use of amphibious raids, a traditional marine mission, to support sea control in littoral areas by attacking enemy anti-air and anti-ship missile batteries. And amphibious forces would be an important enabler for blockade operations because they would be able to contribute a large boarding force as well as small craft to enable those boardings. To execute these and other operations against future threats, the Navy and Marine Corps should prioritize six areas for investment. First, increase the armament of amphibious ships. Amphibious ships today contribute little to the strike capacity of US naval forces beyond what is carried by their aircraft. The Navy should modify its small deck amphibious ships, so the LPD-17 and the follow-on LXR class, to include vertical launch systems, so these platforms have a greater offensive and defensive capacity. Second, increase the size of the amphibious readiness group. Today, the air element of a marine expeditionary unit would be challenged to provide the volume of fires necessary to support the concepts described above. Adding more strike aircraft to the big deck ships in an ARG would displace rotary wing platforms that are needed to allow the Marines to execute assault and airlift operations. Expanding the current three-ship ARG to a four-ship formation that includes a third small deck amphibious ship 
would enable the Marines to field a force with more strike aircraft without sacrificing its airlift capacity. Third, expand the aviation capabilities of the amphibious assault ship. The LHA Flight Zero, LHA Six and Seven, sacrificed a well deck to increase their aviation capacity. The Navy and Marine Corps added a well deck back in for LHA Flight One or LHAs Eight and beyond, albeit at the loss of roughly half the vessel's aviation gas storage capacity. The only way that you can have a well deck and expanded aviation capacity in a ship is to have a bigger ship. Um, one option is to lengthen the LHA Flight 1 design, which would be similar to a course of action the Navy and Marine Corps examined in the mid-2000s for a plug-plus variant of the LHD-8, which would lengthen the hull by about 80 feet and widen the flight deck by 10 feet. Uh, eventually, the United States should consider developing a light aircraft carrier that potentially includes both a well deck and a catapult and arrested recovery system. Fourth, optimize surface connectors for ocean transit. Minimizing the on-land requirements for connectors would drive down cost uh, while allowing the platforms to retain a high water speed, a characteristic that will be critical to their survivability. It would also drive us away from the problems we encountered with the expeditionary fighting vehicle, where you try to have a high water speed and survivability on land, which means you end up with a surface connector that's suboptimal for driving on the ocean and a land vehicle that's suboptimal for operations on land. Fifth, the Marine Corps should acquire lighter vehicles. The Corps' ability to move forces ashore has been hampered by the steadily growing weight and size of its vehicles. To capitalize on the mobility of the V-22 Osprey, the Marines must continue to acquire vehicles and fire support systems small enough to fit aboard the Osprey. In addition, the Corps should prioritize modernizing and upgrading its existing light armored vehicles, which is the lightest armored vehicle in the Corps' inventory, and begin a new program to replace them with an entirely new vehicle that weighs the same amount or less. Lastly, the Corps should acquire cross-domain fires. The Marine Corps currently lacks the ability to influence the sea domain with its ground systems. The Corps should procure a multi-domain weapon with an anti-ship and land attack capability, which can be fired by the Marine Corps' HIMARS launchers. The Corps should also acquire additional HIMARS launchers to supplement its two batteries of missile artillery. Two battalions, sorry. That includes my prepared remarks. I look forward to your questions and want to thank you again for inviting me to speak here today, and go Jumbos. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sloman. I'm going to turn it over to uh, a, a jumbo <laughs> to Mr. Courtney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. Uh, I'm going to ask one question, which yes. and then that will be hopefully good for uh, the break. Um, to both of you, um, one distinguishing difference between the capabilities resident in a carrier air wing and that of the aviation combat element aboard a big deck amphib is E2D. E2D. This capability allows the carrier to be fully networked with the rest of the strike group and thus leverage all of their capabilities. Are there ways in your view where the Navy could better integrate amphibs with other surface forces in order for them to better leverage capabilities like NIFCA counter air? Uh, sure. Um, you know, I think the, the Navy, as they look to uh, a situation where the Marine Corps has F-35Bs and the Navy still has legacy fighters, has been potentially evaluating some options for operating a carrier with uh, all the aviation enablers as well as its four and a half fourth gen fighters alongside a carrier or a LHA operating in a carrier mode with fifth gen fighters. Um, I also think that uh, if we provided the marine aviation combat element with some sort of airborne early warning capability that would significantly uh, increase the survivability of the ARGMU um, as well as just dramatically increase the, the uh, offensive capability of those F-35Bs. Um, and this, the, the lack of a AEW capability on amphibious ships has been a problem since the British executed the Falklands campaign without an airborne early warning asset and had trouble trying to do uh, defensive counter air against the Argentinian fighters. Um, I think some potential options for doing that mission cheaper without an E2D if you're operating an ARGME without a catapult uh, could be putting some sort of uh, less capable radar platform on an unmanned air vehicle like the MUX, um, and that might get you some of the way there because you could get persistence um, and a platform that could stay aloft for a lot of time and still provide you with some sort of uh, radar overwatch. The provision of airborne early warning is going to be absolutely essential to survival in the A2AD environment. And the limitation right now is that uh, one of the major limitations, even with the F-35B for an ARGMU or a, even a larger amphibious force to operate, would be the absence of that. There are a couple of different ways that that can be handled. One is to, that the deployment concept will always, in, uh, that for which a, uh, an ARGMU or an ATF would enter into a contested environment would always involve a carrier strike group with an E-2 
uh, in the vicinity. That's one thing that could be done. Across the longer term, though, I think we're going to need to look at options that make it more organic to the force. And those could include developing different aircraft, which carry an awful lot of expenses with them. The, the bill for developing a new aircraft that can do all the things that you would like an E-2 to do could be quite large. Another possible option, which I think both, both uh, organizations have looked at, is a possibility of building a bigger amphibious ship that can, has catapults and arresting gear that allows the provision of something like an E-2. Now, this isn't something we're going to do in the next uh, five years, but it is something that we could be working toward as, as, we, as we assess future force structure. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. We do have time for uh, an additional question. Dr. Abraham? I'm good. Oh, you're good? Okay. Mr. Desjolais, I think he has stepped out. Mr. Uh, Mr. Byrne. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're, going, we're going down through the list, so. We lectured you on using the microphone, now we got to lecture ourselves. <laughs> uh, back in 2014, the Deputy Commandant for the Marine Corps said that the Marine Corps would be looking to, quote, exploit the gaps and seams in future amphibious operations. So are we still talking about pitting force on force in a contested landing, given that that was what he said back in 2014? I would say that the, the future employment of amphibious forces is going to be maneuver-based and is going to involve the use of uh, intelligence and mobility to take advantage of the gaps and the seams. And that's the future that the Marine Corps ought to be thinking about, the Navy and Marine Corps need to be thinking about. Uh, Part of the challenge, however, is that as long as we're married to the idea of amphibious assault vehicles being the first thing across the beach, you're, you're pretty much in a force-on-force -force in engagement to begin with. So that is the type of capability we would probably want to maintain, but it's probably important to rethink the concepts such that there's more reliance on the inherent value of mobility, agility, speed, hitting them where they ain't. Well, if, in, in, if the future of ship-to-shore connectors are more than likely going to be conducted in a benign environment or during an exploited gap enabled by local sea control and air dominance provided by the Navy and the Air Force, is it wise in a constrained budget environment to increase the cost of these connectors by adding requirements for contested environments we won't be sending them into? By the connectors themselves need to be capable of moving around a lot. I mean, connectors apply to both the aviation and to the surface right. connectors. And the requirements that we're talking about adding aren't necessarily things that are going to add a lot to the cost. I mean, what we're, what we're trying to do is say the MV-22, for example, is a connector. H-53 Kilo is a connector. Both of those things are part of the program of record and are going to be delivered. And really part of the challenge is how to better exploit the capabilities that they provide. I can certainly see an argument that says that uh, a, an amphibious assault connector that's launched from a ship is maybe not your, your better investment. I think we, both, we would agree with that. I would agree with that. Yes, sir. I, I, I agree with Dr. Martin. Um, and I, I would add, I think that even if you had a connector that had uh, some you know some amount of survivability in an environment you're, where you're doing an opposed landing, the ship would have to be so close to shore that you would create um, you know just tremendous risk for a, a capital ship. So I you know I think the Marine Corps has been trying for decades to use range uh, and maneuver you know on, on the seaside um, to try and find those gaps and seams. Uh, I think there's great potential here for unmanned systems. So the Marine Corps just completed a, an experimentation exercise called Antics um, out in the West Coast recently. Um, and they've looked at concepts for using maybe small unmanned service vehicles to, to be part of the first wave of some sort of landing against uh, um, a concentration of enemy forces if you have to do that. 
that might help bring down the risk for platforms that carry uh, people, and also because you're using unmanned systems, maybe you can reduce some of the cost of those. Um, but I think it's, you know, I think the Marine Corps today would be certainly challenged to execute an opposed landing against uh, modern threats, and the Marine Corps has been, or would, will, would have been challenged for quite some time. And it's not just the connector, some of it is the, um, Loss of naval gunfire for support, for example. You know, if you look at the amount of naval gunfire support you could use to prep a beach today versus in like the 1940s, uh, it's a tremendous delta there. Well, I was wondering if it would make some sense to focus on more flexible, agile, and fast connectors to move our Marines to the shore swiftly, such as the exped expeditionary fast transport ships we already have. Would those, would those make sense? The expeditionary tra fast transport ship is certainly a very valuable capability. Uh, one of the things about flexibility and agility, though, is the is not so much with the connectors, but with the platforms themselves. They need to be able to provide at least the amphibious platforms need to be able to provide some level of self defense capability, and that would be that's really what distinguishes an amphib from something that is a uh, uh, that has a uh, a T in front of it. That's that's going to be part of being able to move into certain places. And it's part of the risk assessment about how close the, a, a force could afford to get. But in general, the presumption that we need to be looking more at maneuver and flexibility and lightness is exactly the right way to go. And the idea that we're going to be able to knock down the door with something is probably not the way to go. Well, if you listen to what the, com the deputy commandant was saying, he's, he's saying, let's go to the places where we don't have to knock down the door. Exactly. So if we're, if we're not having to knock down the door, we can take something that's lighter, faster, more agile, get in there and get out and get it done cheaper. That's, that's my only point there. Does that make sense? I, I think we're in violent agreement. Good. Thank you. I, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. We are going to take a quick recess. We should be back uh, right around the 4 o'clock time frame, so I urge our members to come back. I know there are lots of questions that uh, are needed to be asked, so we'll ask our witnesses if they will... Uh, Stay with us, and we will recess. Two, two votes, and we will recess. Should be back in the 4 o'clock time frame.
We will reconvene the Sea Power Subcommittee, and now I'll go to Ms. Bordaglio for the next set of questions. Ms. Bordaglio. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for being at the hearing today. Uh, this, I, I guess, whichever one of you would like to answer. The latest Marine Corps operating concept outlines the desire to see a second amphibious ready group in the Pacific by 2018. Now, we understand that that relies on variables such as funding and vessel availability, but in your view, what capability would a second ARG provide for the Marine Corps, and what resourcing or logistical challenges would need to be prioritized? A second amphibious ready group would be quite valuable in enabling theater security cooperation. Uh, marine forces, amphibious ready groups, and uh, marine expeditionary units are extremely useful for exercises, for working with regional allies. It would also reduce the uh, reaction time for certain types of contingencies. So, in in fact, that would be, in my view, a very good uh, a, a very good use of the force. the The sourcing challenges would be largely a matter of of, uh, of force structure. If for, as far as the Navy's ARGs go, it probably would not be as big a deal because they effectively we'd be moving something out of the continental United States and putting it somewhere in the, in the Western Pacific and having it be there. Uh, with the Marine uh, Expeditionary Unit, it would likely be partly composed of a rotational force and partly composed of people that were there uh, uh, who are stationed there permanently, much like we have in Okinawa now. Uh, the, in terms of sourcing or in terms of support, typically this is done with, uh, with an agreement with a host nation, and it's typically a uh, mutually beneficial type of relationship, which, in my view, would be uh, something very much worth pursuing. So Pacific Command's desire to do this seems to me very consistent with, uh, with what would be in the best interest of, of, the, of the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martin. I would also add more broadly, uh, you know, one of the recommendations in our report was to add a fourth ship to the ARG. Um, and obviously that's a heavy lift in terms of shipbuilding and, you know, actually building enough ships to achieve that requirement. So you may not be able to do that with all of your ARGs. But one way you can get more presence from a, a fewer number of ships or the same number of ships is to put more of them forward. They can rotationally deploy faster. They don't have to transit all the way from the west coast to the east coast. Um, so when we look at potential posture options that go along with some of those recommendations, and this also feeds into the fleet architecture study that CSBA uh, recently completed for the Navy, a large part of that is posturing more ships forward to enable them to have a, a higher presence. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, uh, both of you identified the challenges of sea-based mines, particularly uh, for amphibious operations. Dr. Martin. You referred to the challenges associated with legacy systems and opportunities, specifically with unmanned and underwater systems. Now, I echo your concern regarding the very real and unique A2AD threat of mines, and would be interested to hear your perspective on what the Navy should be doing to strengthen its mine countermeasure toolbox. There are a number of things that the Navy should be considering as it moves forward with the mine countermeasures uh, problem. One is Unmanned is the future of, of uh, mine countermeasures, and we need to be moving out of the legacy systems that, that are manned and, and require exposure of, of uh, personnel to the, the threat as they attempt to clear things. I think in the, one of the big challenges is uh, that the very shallow water has been a place that has historically been a real challenge, and the the types of things that would help us there would be improved unmanned aerial systems to allow better battle space awareness of what's going on, that the fact that people are laying mines. Other parts of it would be uh, unmanned systems that can be put into sh very shallow water and can, and can uh, track the uh, assist in mine hunting and assist in neutralization. And in addition, I think this has got to be coupled with some changes to the operational concepts such that you're not that the, that the landing force is not necessarily always going where it can go other places. That's, that's part of strengthening the aviation capability. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. 
Thank you, Ms. Berdalia. We'll now go to Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank both of you for uh, your extremely thoughtful testimony and joining us in what is a critical conversation. Uh, Mr. Sloman, it's always good to meet another Marine Intelligence Officer. Uh, every day on the Hill, I endure some joke about whether Marine Intelligence is an oxymoron, so your thoughtful testimony is helping me prove that it isn't, uh, and I appreciate that very much. Um, so, and you mentioned something about the antics exercise, if I'm getting that right, and I'd like to dig into that a little bit, because when it comes to this conversation about our Navy Marine Corps team operating in a contested environment, my concern is we're sort of always on the wrong side of the cost curve at every step, and from our amphibs to our aircraft, our rotary wing assets to our sea base connectors, it seems like our adversaries are always able to target that equipment at a lower cost than we're able to protect them. And I appreciate that we, it seems like we can achieve some cost savings in the requirements process, uh, such as minimizing on-land requirements for connectors, but I'm afraid that this bigger picture remains. The relative cost of our systems and, and the high value we, we rightly place on survivability may make political leadership less likely to employ them in a risky expeditionary environment. So on the subject of, of an, a greater role for unmanned systems, which may be a way of getting on the right side of that cost curve, could both of you just comment on if we were going to invest heavily in that approach, what would that look like? How would we change how we're operating? Uh, so specifically with reference to the antics exercise, I think one of the, uh, one of the two most um, uh, potentially fruitful areas for using those unmanned systems would be the countermine mission, you know, so ha or, or sort of a beach reconnaissance role. So having small unmanned vehicles that could operate well forward of the, the manned assets um, to really determine what the sort of picture of defenses are at the, at the whatever beach you're landing at, and especially mines. And then also potentially as a host for the sort of fires that you would need as you close to the beach. The Marine Corps kind of has this problematic gap where you have a lot of fires potentially resident on your platform, your capital ships that you're launching ships from, especially if you add a VLS uh, capability like we propose. Uh, and then you potentially have a lot of fires once you kind of establish your forces ashore and you can put your artillery in place and, uh, and also use air support. But as the forces are transiting to the beach, they don't really have right now any fires capability. And this is something you had in World War II um, and, and subsequent, but we've sort of lost in the force. Yeah. So having small MF vehicles that had fires that could provide fire support for forces as they're doing that uh, long transit from wherever they left the capital ship to where they're landing, I think is a potentially very useful job for the unmanned vehicles. I agree completely with what Mr. Sloman just said. I would add that the ability to establish wide area battle space surveillance is an important feature of uh, being able to operate in this type of environment. Unmanned aerial vehicles that are organic to both the ARG and the MU would be helpful in that respect. Also, the, the whole uh, capability of doing beach surveillance from unmanned systems would be is an important, uh, another important feature. And the last thing is that we talk, I talked earlier about the issue with uh, surf zone mining. And that may be a particular area where we have to look at specialized types of unmanned vehicles that may be expendable that we're effectively using to neutralize the broad range of mines that have been laid in the surf zone and are going to be difficult to, to deal with in any other way. And right now, effectively, the only way we've got to deal with it is blow them up or send somebody in to countermine or whatever. And unmanned systems are probably going to be very effective in that, in that area. And Mr. Sloman, I'd just be interested, as a Marine Intel officer, do you think, are we doing a good job in that community thinking creatively about the future threat environment and really challenging the assumptions upon which our amphibious doctrine is based? I mean, it's been my experience, sort of lay my cards out there, that we should have prioritized the short-term thinking over that real long-range uh, analysis. But I'd just be interested in your thoughts, given your experience. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, I mean, as you've experienced, sir, the when you're in a billet or you're in, in the, a, a line unit, um, you're worried about the next exercise, which usually is about some very near-term threat, or you're going off and doing some sort of kind of narrowly scoped uh, operational problem. Um, I don't know how many Marine officers get the freedom to think uh, you know, about those mid to long-term threats. And then I also am concerned if the Marines start spending uh, uh, more time and sending more personnel to do the kind of GWAT type missions that uh, you know may be ascendant 
uh, we might run, end up in a situation like we have for the past decade where we really become almost like a second land army or the Marine Corps really becomes a second land army, um, executing mostly counterinsurgency, counterterrorism type missions. And again, sort of that amphibious knowledge base kind of starts to drop out of the force. Sure. Thank you both. I yield. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. We'll now go to Ms. Hanabusa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> One of the most interesting part about the amphibious operations is, uh, as it was described once, about the image that we all have is, is World War II and the wave and wave of amphibious vessels. I tell people, imagine the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan, and that's the image that most of us have. But we also realize that that's not the way we are going to, quote, fight in the future. It's just not part of it. The um, Dr. Martin's concern about A2AD, I represent Hawaii. Believe me, we are very familiar with it, and we are also very concerned. I'm not sure that the amphibious uh, vessels are the way you counteract A2AD. AD. And, and, uh, and in, as well, in the whole issue that we were discussing earlier, which is the role of the unmanned. As we know with the, uh, the uh, FSA, which was done, which the fleet size uh, assessment with, with Secretary, former Secretary Mavis's 355 and everyone else, and I think your organization, Mr. Sloman, had a large number of unmanned. So given what you're describing, as you see, potentially as the role of the amphibious uh, vessel, why do you not think that you're actually moving towards a, a, a recommendation towards unmanned versus an, an increase in amphibious vessels with Marines? Like right now, we're about, about 10 vessels with at least 6,000 Marines uh, being deployed in any one day. So why, why do you not think that that's not... Uh, the way that uh, the future is? Because it seems like we got to think about the future. What's the effective way to do this battle? Wh whichever one of you want to start. Well, I, obviously Mr. Sloman has some thoughts on this too. But, <laughs> I, I, but I'll, I'll start by saying I, I would agree that amphibious vessels in and of themselves are not the things that are going to overcome an A2AD environment. There's something that that we have to, to uh, we, the, the nation, would have to address uh, the military would have to address to enable the use of that type of capability. That type of capability is useful in achieving certain types of effects, and our, the, my argument is that we should consider the ability to carry out those types of effects as being useful and find ways to enable them and use aspects of the amphibious force to allow that to happen. Uh, countering A2AD is going to involve a large component of un unmanned vessels that are unmanned capabilities. Uh, that's a place we should be investing. I think that the major uh, capability enhancements that we're talking about for the amphibious force largely deal with ways to exploit the cap potential capability of unmanned and also to exploit the inherent value of mobility and scalability. So those are the things that the amphibious force will continue to bring with us even as we move into the other areas where the challenges still exist. Uh, specifically on the unmanned systems, I mean, obviously those have a role to play in, in this A2D environment. Uh, I think we're at different levels of maturity with respect to integrating those in the force. So I think unmanned air systems we have a lot of experience with, and there's some technical reasons that we're just, it's easier to, to use those. Um, I think... And in the CSBA fleet architecture study, we were somewhat conservative, actually, about our use of unmanned service vehicles and, and even unmanned undersea vehicles, partly because there, there are a lot of technical and policy challenges that we have to work out. And I think we're not 100% certain um, exactly the, the maximum extent that we can uh, uh, use those systems. So for example, from a policy standpoint, uh, how willing are you to put munitions on those systems? How willing are you to? Grant or how much autonomy could you potentially grant an unmanned system if you expect to be operating in an anti-access area denial environment where your communications will be disrupted, you may not be able to communicate that easily with your unmanned systems. Do you mind if the enemy takes them? If it's an unmanned service vehicle and it's operating at peacetime, theoretically someone could just grab it, which has happened in real life. You know, we don't have good norms for protecting our unmanned vehicles right now. Um, so 
you know, we opted to be a little bit conservative, and I think we still have to work through those challenges. I'm running out of time, but I just would like to ask you to consider this. I, I believe that we set policy by acquisition. So as we talk about the balance here, when we buy an amphibious vessel, it could be a lot of money versus an unmanned. So that's the trade-off that we, I think, have to decide on this particular area as to who better serves it with the limited resources that we have. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Hanabusa. We'll now go to Mr. Hunter. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And if you already answered this, please tell me and I'll ask the staff what, what the answer was. Uh, it's a really simple question, though. Where could you do a contested amphibious landing right now? Tell me, tell me, and obviously the countries that are peer competitors and also non-peer competitors, just tell me, where, where could you actually do it at? There are a number of places you could do it uh, without getting into the actual plans. Any place that offers a littoral type of... Uh, China's got littoral type of... Yeah, uh, China... Couldn't, you couldn't do China. You couldn't do China without a whole lot of prior preparation. There are places that... I, I think that, that's arguable, but... Yeah, there are places that... I don't know that we would do China. There are places where it could be done with... Uh, it could be done with an adequate amount of prior preparation, prior dominance, and all the rest of it. I would say that the areas that are most susceptible to it would be the places where there is a uh, a moderate level of A2AD capability, which we're capable of uh, overcoming. Uh, it would be places where there is some strategic advantage to uh, gaining parts of the coast or gaining an island. Uh, and it would be places where it would be valuable to have a level of force that might not be the same as an outright major contingency operation, but would be in the nature of a, uh, a limited type of response. So there are, uh, off the top of my head, I can think of uh, many places where that could be done and could be done in a credible way. I, I'm a little reluctant to name specific let me, let places. Me, let me ask it this way. In, in, um so let's look out 15 or 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. When when everybody, when every even non-peer competitors have uh, have ballistic missiles to be able to be able to, to shoot at ships, mm -hmm. do do you think amphibious warfare may be going away? You're, you're never going to have a Saving Private Ryan or no. Iwo Jima uh, again. You're never going to have that because you're not going to make it to shore. You wouldn't ever. Do, no, you wouldn't do save it, pri Saving Private Ryan because it involves putting the ships so close to shore that you would be. Uh, that they'd be vulnerable to a, no, a number of different things. You know, but, the, the ability, but explain to me, the in amphibious to assault, you'd have to have ships close to shore the by definition, right? Well, part of the discussion we're having is the ability to move around and stay out of range and provide deception and provide uh, surveillance and, and to attack the seams. So in a case where you, I can foresee a situation in 15 or 20 years where we have established sufficient dominance in a particular part of the operating area that we would want to be able to move forces other than, than aircraft, uh, for example, where we would want to be able to move forces into the, an area for, to achieve some effects. But that wouldn't be a contested amphibious assault. That would be an a amphibious landing where you already have dominance, where you have air dominance well, and, and, would, and so forth, and you're not going to get hit with a cruise missile. Would be amphibious. 500 miles offshore. Amphibious oper well, I mean, probably not that far, but it would be amphibious operation in an environment where you had to, you had to figure out ways to counter the threat before carrying out the operation. And that's part of it. And, and I can think of many places where that could occur. And, if, and, uh, and I guess uh, what I would also emphasize is that this is, this is not something that only amphibious forces would have to deal with. Any conventional force is going to have to be able to overcome some portion of the A2AD threat in order to be able to carry out any operation. And, that's, and, and part of the balance between offense and defense is something that's just part of the... Uh, part of the threat assessment that we continually have to make. So I would, so anyway. Sir, so just real quick, I would offer that uh, if you can get the ships far enough offshore, so maybe 200 miles, for example, against a competitor that doesn't have huge stores of precision weapons, you may be able to thin the salvo, the offensive salvo from their end. Um, 
to the point that you could potentially defend against that, or at least you would reduce the amount of weapons you might face to a pretty small number, depending on your, your adversary's inventories. And then I would also uh, offer, with respect to China, it's, it is difficult, very difficult certainly to imagine landing uh, uh, on the shores of mainland China, but I think there's a great potential for using amphibious capabilities in some of the claimed islands, for example. I could see a scenario where you might want to, to put forces there or to regain control of uh, some disputed territories after they've been seized by an opponent. Okay. Thank you. I, I just feel like in some ways we're in an amphibious box. I was a uh, Marine too, and I did three tours, and I flew over all three times. Never been on a ship for more than three days in the Gulf. But I, I think we're kind of, we might put ourselves in an amphibious box where we assume that it, it's still going to be relevant in 20 years when it might not be. Certainly thank, might thank not you. be. Yeah, there, there is that possibility. Uh, at the same time, by that chain of reasoning, there's a whole bunch of things that we couldn't do in 20 years. We wouldn't be able to fly out of uh, pack air out of fixed bases in the Philippines. And, there, and there, there are ways to, there are ways to offset advantages. And part of the, rather than than taking the step of saying it's irrelevant, part of the step we need to take is to figure out ways that given that we think parts of it are useful, are there ways that it could be made? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. We'll now go to Mrs. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. I'm sorry I w wasn't able to hear the uh, remarks prior to the vote, but I had a few questions. They may have been asked. One of the things that we're talking <clears throat> about here, and certainly my, my colleague from San Diego, um, in, in asking those questions is part of it, you know, what does the future look like and are the plans that we have today realistic or in some cases unrealistic? Uh, and if you could put that in the framework of, I think you, you may have mentioned uh, on shipbuilding, you were, uh, someone asked that question and the integration with more forward operations versus not. And so what, you know, what's the proposed number of ships that support our amphibious operations as appropriate or, or not. And then when it comes to aviation, aviation readiness shortfalls in the Navy and Marine Corps, how do they affect, again, amphibious operations? And finally, the expeditionary support bases and advanced bases, how are they incorporated into the future of amphibious operations? If you could and I go through that in, in a way that's a little, little specific for us, that would be helpful. And if I could throw in one more thing. So as we're talking about the updates to our connectors and um, we, are, do we have gaps in training around new technology that um, are problematic? And how are we addressing those going forward? Uh, yes, ma'am. And I, I'm sorry if you've already addressed this in great detail. Uh, we, we have not. Um, so CSBA recommended in our, our fleet architecture study that uh, in response to an NDAA um, that we go from 16 small deck amphibs to be procured over the next 30 years to 25 small deck amphibs procured over the next 30 years. And we determined that that would be about a 4% increase on average in the uh, Navy shipbuilding budget. That's averaged out over the entire 30-year period, so it might be more, significantly more in the first 10 years, for example, depending on the rate at which you want to procure those ships. And there are some things you can do to bring the cost down a little bit of procuring extra small deck amphibs, uh, like potentially um, uh, speeding the procurement of the LXR, for example, the LPD-17 replacement. Uh, with respect to advanced bases, um, I think the rationale for arguing for advanced bases partly has to do with some of the questions that the uh, members have, have directed to us um, with reference to the cost exchange balance. When you look at these A2, AD situations, our argument for using advanced bases or for creating some capability to put marine units ashore that can influence the sea and air domains is that that helps reverse the cost exchange ratio. So our potential adversaries have tailored their capabilities to try and disrupt what's traditionally seen as our strengths. So uh, carrier-based aircraft, uh, short-range tactical fighters at large bases, um, surface vessels. Expeditionary advanced bases would create a mobile uh, capability, certainly for the, for the bases close to an, an, an opponent, um, to fire any ship or any air weapons that would force them to try and seek out small ground forces with low signatures that are relatively cheap. 
this is the problem the U.S. has frequently encountered in, in our wars. You know, if you look at the Scud hunts in 1991, trying to find these mobile launchers, very difficult problem. Trying to find mobile ground forces in Kosovo in 1999, extremely difficult problem. We've never exactly fall, solved the problem of how to find mobile transport erector launchers that are driving about uh, with very low signatures. And so creating, even if your offensive capacity isn't that high, but creating that threat that the enemy has to honor and potentially divert some of their spending towards and some of their military assets towards, I think is one potential way to t help try and flip that cost exchange ratio and give them almost a mini A2AD problem to help try and uh, combat within their mm -hmm. near abroad. And, and on the training, uh, how, and I guess just going back to a second in terms of the shipbuilding, because uh, we're also talking about the number of ships that support um, the operation, amphibious operations. How comfortable do you feel um, we are moving ahead with that? And, and where are the so with where does where does it not connect in in, in the the sense of um, the plans and, and and what we would like to see are really out of whack right now. Uh, we don't meet two point five meb lift. Yes, certainly. The, the, I mean, if the requirement is is for two point five meb lift, we're not going to be anywhere close. It's also true that every time you add a, an amphibious ready group and you pr project it to operate in a contested environment, there will be surface ships that go with it. And all of the services, Marine Corps has got a problem with aviation readiness and Navy's got a problem with uh, ship readiness. All of those things have to be addressed. One of the problems with trying to greatly expand the size of, a, of, of the force would be it's not just the initial cost, it's the subsequent readiness costs that go along with this. So we would have to, uh, the nation, not we, but the nation would have to uh, consider all those things as it made a decision to seek a particular type of capability. Do you think we do that very well? I think the nation and the services occasionally do not take into account the long-term cost of operating a force and as a result can make some investment decisions that become questionable over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think my time is up, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. We appreciate that. Gentlemen, I want to um, get your perspective on what we see today as the mix of capabilities within the amphibious force. We have uh, connectors, about two-thirds of our connectors are to move amphibious forces ashore. Uh, and the other element is the aviation element that also moves the remainder of forces. Uh, it's been suggested that uh, we look at that ratio, and is that ratio correct today, the two-thirds to one-third uh, connectors versus aviation? Uh, and those surface connectors, I think, you know, as we look at modernizing those surface connectors, that's certainly a situation. Let me, let me get your perspective. Do you think the current ratio is correct? And if not, what should be the ratio? And then what would that new ratio mean for our legacy forces today? And what would a future Marine force look like with a different ratio of surface connectors to aviation assets? As I said in my opening statement, the Marine Corps is facing a explosion of improvement in capability in the aviation mm -hmm. capabilities that it's got. And it would be wise for the Marine Corps to exploit that to a greater degree. Uh, what that implies is that more of the force gets moved ashore by aviation, uh, less of the force gets moved ashore by surface, and the real the challenge that that would impose is that some of the things that the Marine Corps is used to uh, requiring as part of the landing force would not get there as quickly. As it, might, as, as it might otherwise. And a lot of the fire support, for example, would be more dependent on aviation fire support than it would be the thing, like the, the tanks, the armor, that type of thing that could get moved ashore by, by surface. So ac across the long term, the need for to re-examine concepts that depend heavily on armored forces moved by surface connectors needs to be reevaluated and that and that uh, that will affect 
that do, doesn't really affect the Marine Corps Aviation Program of record all that much. What it does affect is some of the Marine Corps thinking about its capabilities and also affects, and, and doctrine, it also affects some of what would go into the amphibious shipping, what they're, what they're going to be optimized to carry. Yeah. Very good. Mr. Sloman? Yeah, I, I think the the biggest factor that would affect that ratio, uh, if, you know, if you sort of look at it from what do you need on the beach and what do you need to have ashore to fight, and then you sort of backtrack and think about what connectors can get that there, the biggest limitation right now is the vehicle weight problem. So there's really not that much the Marines can bring ashore just by air, which creates a, a challenge if you're a beach master trying to figure out what your amphibious loading plan is. Um, I think that if you can drive down the vehicle weight without sacrificing too much survivability, and we recommend acquiring lighter, lighter vehicles, then your aviation lift becomes uh, much more useful and you can bring a larger percentage of the force ashore. And I, in the long term, I think it's important to move um, or to try and move beyond this paradigm where more survivability necessarily equates to more weight. There are some DARPA programs that are looking at ways that you could potentially have survivable ground vehicles that leverage agility or leverage active and passive defenses in addition to heavy armor. But if every, more, if every vehicle that you try and make more survival becomes exponentially heavier, you really run into a big challenge trying to bring them ashore by aircraft. So then you have to go to service connectors, which may reduce the vulnerability in the vehicles because they have all this armor, but it dramatically increases their vulnerability during the ship to shore transit stage. Absolutely. Very good. <laughs> Mr. Sloman, let me ask this. Um, Mr. Hunter talked about what the future environment will look like, and much of this is a discussion about uh, Marine Corps capabilities, both in a benign environment and a contested environment. And that obviously is going to change as we look out into the future. Um, can you explain how uh, the Marine Corps approach to amphibious warfare in a benign environment and a contested environment would be different and is there a range at which you would project forces in a benign environment uh, that may be different than what you would in a contested environment? Uh, so just kind of give us your, your range. We talked about the contested environment, but you also alluded to the ability to, to prosecute the seams or to find areas where it's less contested or even a benign environment. Then you have logistical issues about being able to move forces distances to the objective. So give us your perspective, because I'd like to, you to dive a little bit deeper into, into that realm of what, um, what was asked earlier, just so we understand the benign versus contested environment and amphibious warfare capability. So I think um, one challenge when you look at a potentially benign environment is the proliferation of anti-ship cruise missiles with non-state actors. Mm -hmm. So environments that maybe 20 or 30 years ago we assumed were benign or at least benign for a ship that was stood off maybe 10 or 15 miles from the coast may no longer be benign and we might not even know that it's not benign. You know, In other words, a non-state yeah. actor might have some sort of weapon system that could target our capital ships. Uh, and the, the Houthi attack on um, uh, U.S guided missile destroyers, and then also the Saudi, um, or United Arab Emirates uh, joint high-speed vessel, you know, brings that to mind. Um, I think in a truly benign environment, or one where we could be assured that there would be no anti-ship missile threat within tens of miles of the coast, we would be able to bring in our maritime pre-positioning force uh, sea lift capability, and that would very much increase the, the, or decrease the offload time required to put significant forces ashore. Uh, having a defensible port facility is hugely valuable if you're trying to move heavy equipment off of a ship. Um, but I think it's important not to assume that that MPF shipping, so essentially civilian shipping, can be used in uh, even a mildly contested environment, particularly close to shore. And I, the Marine Corps and the Navy seem to be moving a little bit in that direction, kind of in the 2000s with some of the discussion about sea basing. I think that was a dangerous direction to go, mm -hmm. to assume that your MPF shipping would be part and parcel of an amphibious force against even a, 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 any enemy that had the capability to reach out and hit ships at 10 to 20 miles from, from the shore. So I think we should acknowledge up front that the MPF shipping is not a substitute for amph amphibious shipping, and it really can only be used if you assume that there is no threat at all uh, from an anti-ship cruise missile armed adversary. Very good. Dr. Martin? The important thing is not so much the distance as the ability to 
not telegraph location, which may occasionally be a matter of deception that puts you puts the force in range of anti ship cruise missiles or the anti access threat. So the future probably doesn't mean that we should be uh, that the nation, the, the Navy, the Marine Corps should be developing long range connectors that are supposed to move things hundreds of miles. It's more in the nature of locating ways of uh, masking the movement, of finding ways to better understand what the adversary is doing, finding ways of suppressing uh, aspects of the A2D uh, network long enough to allow some significant part of, of the operation. Uh, and that will involve a fairly or highly mobile and sophisticated uh, effort that relies a lot on sensors, that relies a lot on intelligence fusion, and relies a lot on uh, the ability to make the enemy fire the anti-access weapon, anti weapons into open ocean. But, but trying to construct a, con a situation where it's all range-based, it'll never work. Range can always get increased. Yeah. Um, as far as the general ability to operate in a uh, close to shore, not everybody is going to have an A2AD capability equivalent to what the Chinese or the, or the Russians would be putting out. Uh, there are lots of places where the contested environment is is such that it can be handled with less risk to the force. Mm -hmm. And what that, and the way to be able to operate in those types of environments is uh, is to accurately assess the threat and provide sufficient organic capability for the the landing force and for the amphibious force to be able to to operate in a fairly, in a more limited way. And we've, we've talked about a couple of the things that would involve. Some of it is better unmanned surveillance sensors. Some of it is possibly being able to organically assign airborne warning. There's a lot of different things that, that could enable that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sloman, I wanted to pick up on the point that you made about weight of combat capability being moved ashore. And I want to ask you specifically about the Marine Corps' effort to recapitalize the amphibious assault vehicle through the development of the, uh, of the amphibious combat vehicle program, looking at that transition. As you know, part of that is doing a service life extension on AAVs, which is a 50-year-old vehicle, and then building new uh, ACVs. So in the effort to recapitalize this legacy program, how does how does that fit into what you look into the future about the forcible entry component of an amphibious force? Do you see that direction uh, in, the, in the recapitalization of legacy programs there and the, what you brought about at weight and capability? Give us your perspective on, on how that fits into where things need to be in the future. Yes, sir. Um, I think the Marine Corps is moving in the right direction with having a replacement for the AAV have not a significant swim requirement. Mm -hmm. I, I think trying to build another EFV is the wrong road. Mm -hmm. You know, that creates significant engineering risk, yeah. very expensive vehicle, um, and one that just seems unlikely to be fielded anytime soon. Mm -hmm. I am not sure that the ACV, the ACV is large mm -hmm. uh, compared to other equivalent types of ground vehicles, and it perhaps is under armed mm -hmm. uh, relative to the threat, I think having a larger weapon on it would be would be a very useful capability, but I think that generally having a vehicle optimized for the ground with minimal swim capability that would be brought close to shore by a connector and then disgorged um, is definitely the right direction for the Marine Corps to go, rather than have a gold-plated, fantastically swimmable mm -hmm. ground vehicle. Gotcha. Very good, Dr. Martin. Your your perspective. What this involves is it backing away from the idea that the first thing across the beach is going to be motorized, you know, is a mechanized infantry. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that the first parts of the assault element are going to be 
likely delivered by air, mm -hmm. and that these capabilities are going to be only delivered after some part of the beach is made secure enough that they can move uh, this type of force over the beach. Mm -hmm. If that were to occur, uh, I'm not absolutely certain that that would be the first thing to arrive. The first thing to arrive might very well be some other portion of the marine landing force that is viewed as being more effective and useful. So I think the major thing that the major thing that we would like to have from this type of vehicle would be suitability as an infantry ashore weapon and not at all really an amphibious vehicle mm -hmm. really not a lot of value in having that uh, having that capability which i think is pretty much what we both we both agree on that on that point very good thank you mr burn do you have any any additional questions Okay, very good. Mr. Hunter, any additional questions? Dr. Martin uh, reminds me that Robin Williams wrote all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, uh, I've had other people say the same thing. Uh, so, so uh, well, Nanu Nanu. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, <laughs> if there are no further questions, then this committee, subcommittee, excuse me, stands adjourned. And gentlemen, thanks again for your testimony today.